This is chapter 11 of the textbook, the section on inductive mm -hmm. reasoning, um, about causal reasoning. Mm -hmm. Actually, the chapter title is Causal versus Statistical Relevance. Um, and this is because we kind of segue in from the uh, inductive generalization, which actually, to review again, inductive generalization is a kind of analogy, right? And so we have to should think about all of these three reasoning types of reasoning, right? Well, analog analogical arguments, um, inductive generalization, and then these methods for determining causal relations. In a sense, as forms of analogy, because that's what they seem to be. But recall that with the analog analogical argument, its strength depends on the relevance of the similarities that are in the base analogates to the features which are the target analogate or is the target analogate, right? So we've used some terms interchangeably here, analogates and features, right? The analogates are the features uh, which we are, in terms of which we are comparing the two things, right? And on the basis of which we're asserting that since they're similar in certain ways, then they're gonna be similar in other ways, or likely to be similar in other ways. And an inductive generalization is basically the same thing going on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, except that we're quantifying it. And we're saying that a certain proportion of X type things has a certain feature and therefore the same proportion in a sample, right? Yeah, of things. And therefore the same proportion of all X type things has that feature. Mm -hmm. So now we're comparing a sample to the general population of that type of things. And we had to say that the kind of relevance that there, that there may be between different features could be statistical or it could be causal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this arises at least from asking what kinds of relevance, you know, uh, what, how are things relevant to each other? How are features, uh, different features relevant to each other in such a way to give us justification or to make us feel justified in inferring that the presence of uh, inferring the presence of one from the presence of another, right? And to some degree or to some proportion or however it is when we're thinking this way. So anyway, two types of those relevance are uh, causal and statistical relevance. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty simple. The base analogates are causally relevant when they are known to cause, under normal circumstances, the target analogy. But they're statistically relevant, or we might say merely statistically relevant, when they statistically correlate to the target analogy. And we say the two things are correlated when they repeatedly accompany each other, right? Mm -hmm. So the easiest way to distinguish between these two things, uh, you know, or an easy way to distinguish between these two things is to use the example which I gave in the book about Pavlov's dog, right? So if you recall what it was, what was said there, Pavlov thought he discovered, right, behavioral conditioning uh, because of the fact that he took a dog and every time he was going to feed the dog, he rang a bell before he brought the dog food. Mm -hmm. And he did that repeatedly until such time as when, you know, he rang the bell without bringing the food he measured the amount of salivation that comes out of the dog's mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then he said, okay, look, when I ring the bell and not, and without bringing him food, yeah, I, he salivates. So I've conditioned him right to expect food after the bell rings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, what did I say in the chapter? If the dog could talk, I mean, we might ask him, why are you salivating? You might say, well, because I heard the bell ring and the bell makes food come. Mm -hmm. right? He thinks there's a causal relation between the bell and the food. If we imagine him saying that, right? Mm -hmm. But in fact, there's not a causal relation because the bell is not the reason why the food came. It didn't cause the food to come. It's merely the case that they had been correlated, right? Every time the bell rang, food came. Yeah. And so correlation between two things is not the same as causation, as people often say, right? Um, and so we have to distinguish between those two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet it's still 
a kind of relevance. So even if something is only statistically correlated to another feature, the presence of the first one is relevant to the likelihood of the presence of the next, right? Mm -hmm. So we might say that the dog was mistaken in thinking that the bell causes food, right? But we might not want to say that the dog is mistaken in expecting food to arrive because, well, perhaps on the basis of the statistical correlation between the bell and the food in the past, then given that the bell rang this time, the probability of food coming was really high, right? As a matter of fact, though, it didn't come. Anyway, this raises a lot of puzzles about inductive reasoning and about what probability is which are philosophical puzzles that are important, but definitely important for any critical thinker. You have to really, you know, sort of think these things through. But it's not within the scope of this class to introduce those puzzles or to try to solve those things. Because as a matter of practical fact, right, um, we do rate the probability of something higher, you know, if it has been correlated to something in the past, which we see in front of us, right? So. As a matter of fact, you know, if A and B have been repeatedly correlated in the past and we experience A happening in front of us, we do conclude that it's highly probable or more probable that B will happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, why and what is the sort of uh, nature of the justification that we have to, to, to conclude that and whether we're justified to conclude that is a deep philosophical problem and, you know, epistemology and philosophy of science, which, you know, we should not forget, but right now we have to lay it aside. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so if it's the case, though, that there's a difference between statistical relevance and causal relevance, and maybe there's not, but <laughs> let's say if there is, then what would we, what would we say about what, what a cause is? What is it to be causally relevant? Well, as we said, you know, one thing is causally relevant to another when it causes that thing to occur. Well, that's a little bit circular. That's very circular, actually. Mm -hmm. So what is it to cause something? That's also a, another philosophical question, uh, which underlies the whole um, viability of inductive reasoning, right? But we can't do it without inductive reasoning. So, you know, we're going to go on and talk about it without solving the philosophical puzzle. Um, Aristotle had a definition of cause, which is really good because it's very simple and broad and gets right to the point. He said a cause is an answer to the question why. Yeah. And one of the reasons that's a really good sort of definition of cause is that it sort of opens up or leaves open, let's say, the range of different ways in which we can think of something as a cause and ways in which we sort of answer the question why. And therefore, Aristotle sort of laid out four different types of causes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so even if we're not Aristotelian and we don't think all the way like Aristotle, it's important to know about these different concepts of cause because they are in one way or another uh, certain, we use these concepts and even if we don't call them cause all the time nowadays, we use these concepts and they are different answers to the question why actually. So they are the formal cause, the final cause, the efficient cause and the material cause. Usually when we think of a cause now, we normally think of the efficient cause because the efficient okay. cause for Aristotle was something or some event that occurred, uh, you know, something which is separate and distinct from the effect which brought about the effect, all right? So if I tap on the desk and make that sound, right, you might ask, you know, well, if I, you heard that sound, you might ask, what was the cause of that sound? If I say, well, it's me tapping on the desk, that would be the efficient cause, right? The effect is one thing that's the sound. My tapping on the desk is a distinct thing from that, and it happened, right? Uh, that event, my tapping on the desk made the sound come about this distinct thing. Right, it's an action or an event or a change that occurred that caused that sound. Um, <clears throat> so that's different than a final cause where you might ask, well, why did you do that? You know, why did you make that sound? And I might say, well, it was in order to produce an example so that I could explain to you what an efficient cause is. 
In that case, I'm talking about the final cause, which is the sort of function or the purpose or the reason, you know, for it to be or for it to happen. In this case, the reason why I did it. But Aristotle thinks of final cause is not just in terms of, you know, things that people do or reasons why people do or things that people make, for example. Like we can talk about the final cause of a knife being it's there to cut with, right? That's why a knife exists in order to cut things, right? So it's an answer to the question why. But if you say, why do people have hearts? Well, that's there to plump blood, right? Why do people have lungs, you know, in order to absorb oxygen? Why do people have legs in order to walk? So these are the final causes of in these parts of an organism, right? Aristotle was really into organisms. So he saw final causes around, and those are a kind of cause, too, in the sense that they are answered the question why. Okay, so... The formal and material cause kind of come together. Um, if you see that there are, uh, you know, a, a number of clay statues, maybe clay statues of liberty in a souvenir shop somewhere, um, then you will uh, see that they both, they all have the same shape. They're all statues of liberty, but they're all made of clay, right? So, but one one the clay is different. Piece of clay is different from another. So the formal cause is right the kind of shape, or this you know in this case of 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 the clay that makes it a statue of liberty, and the material causes the clay that it's made out of. Right. So, uh, in general, then the formal cause is the nature of a thing that you could give in a definition which makes it the kind of thing that it is, whereas the material cause is the stuff, right, which was shaped according to that nature or changed according to that nature in order to bring about the specific existence of, of that thing, right? Yeah. So, and the example in the book we gave was that for the definition of a square being a shape with four equal sides and equal angles. And that this would be the formal cause of the square because that's what it is about the thing in front of you that makes it a square. Whereas the material cause might be, you know, the paper it's written on or the ink that it's drawn with, right? The, the actual stuff that is, you know, formed according to that form in order to actually you know, bring about the existence of that thing right to that square. Yeah, so that's a little bit more complex. But in general, if we're talking about what makes the thing what it is, we'd be talking about the formal cause. And if we talk about what something is made out of, you know, and to put it simply, we'd be talking about the material cause. So there's just different answers to the question, different kinds of answers to the question why. And for Aristotle, that means there are different kind of causes. The formal cause usually can be considered nowadays as a logical condition. So in modern philosophers, right, usually distinguish between logical and causal conditions, although Aristotle would have just called them all causal conditions. A logical condition of a thing follows from its definition, right? So a, a, a shape has to have four sides in order to be a square. That's a logical condition because of the fact that a square by definition is a four-sided shape with equal sides uh, joined at equal angles, right? Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't call that a causal condition of a thing, right? The cause of the square for us would, most of the time in modern thinking, would be just what Aristotle thinks of as the efficient cost. So, you know, you can't have a square unless, you know, there's something to make the marks, you know what I mean, which actually sort of create a square and a square shape, so... If a person draws a square, that would be the thing that brings the square about, right? Or, you know, in whatever way that it happens. Yeah. Okay. And there can be necessary and sufficient conditions in either case. We already talked about necessary and sufficient logical conditions when we talked about definitions earlier in the class. But we can also have necessary and sufficient causal conditions. So, right, my taking a marker and, you know, running, running it across a piece of paper in just the right way will be a sufficient condition, right, for bringing about a square, right, if the paper's there and everything else. That's enough to make a square happen, yeah. 
It's not necessary though, because somebody else could draw a square on a different kind of material with a different kind of, you know, a mark maker. Yeah. Or a square can come about in some other way. Uh, that's sufficient then. That's enough to bring about a square, but it's not, you know, necessary. And certainly, right, some kind of mark is necessary for squares. So we can talk about necessary causal conditions. This would be more akin to what Aristotle calls a material cause. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we also should distinguish between like what we think of as the cause and the background conditions. Mm -hmm. So the, a good example to use to talk about or to illustrate the difference between necessary and sufficient causal conditions is the fire triangle, right? Which we learned in, well, I learned in Boy Scouts, yeah? If you were in Girl Scouts, you might have learned it too, or maybe they taught you about it in school. But it's good to know because, you know, it's good for like, you know, how to, you know, how to put out a fire and how to keep a fire from happening. And that's good for safety or I don't know, if you're out in the desert and you need to start a fire to stay alive. You got to remember what are the three things that you need? Well, a fire requires fuel, oxygen and heat, right? And so all three of those together in the right way are a sufficient condition for a fire. Yeah, that means those three things are enough. To bring about a fire, but each one of them uh, separately is a necessary condition, but not sufficient. So you cannot have a fire without fuel. You cannot have a fire without oxygen, and you cannot have a fire without heat. <clears throat> right? And neither one of them by itself will bring about fire because you have to have all three of them together. But each one of them by itself is necessary. So if you have a fire and you want to put it out, you know, you got to remove one of those three things, right? Uh, removing one of those three things from the situation is going to be enough to put the fire out. So that's how you think about this. And, uh, well, another thing that we can use to, another thing that we can illustrate with this example is the difference between the cause and the background condition. So when we're thinking about these as conditions, if we want to ask, you know, what started the fire, Usually we think of something that happened, some kind of new change that occurred. So let's say there's oxygen in the air <clears throat> and I mean, there's oxygen in the air all the time, right? So precisely for that reason, if a house burns down and the fire department comes and the fire inspector wants to know and find out how did the house burn down, what caused the fire? And you know, his, uh, uh maybe he's got a philosopher <laughs> on his fire department who's a little bit of a smart ass and says, well, I know what caused the fire, the presence of oxygen, right? Because you need oxygen for fire. And well, probably the fire chief would say, no, I, that oxygen's everywhere. That doesn't really, that doesn't really help us, right? When we're looking for the cause of the fire, we're looking for not some condition which is necessary for fire and part of the conditions that bring about fire, but which is always the case and is a constant. We're looking for the thing that changed. Right. There's always been right oxygen there and the house is made out of wood. So the fuel's always been there. But what changed to bring about a fire? Well, then that's where the heat comes in. OK, there's a spark maybe or a, a short circuit. That change is what we usually think about when we think about the cause. Whereas the other things that are conditions for that event to happen, but are constant and we're always there. We normally don't think about it as a cause, but we think about them as background conditions, right? Even though a complete explanation of why it happened requires, right, those background conditions, because without those background conditions, it wouldn't have been the case. Yet we usually identify the cause as the thing that changed, right? For practical purposes, that's what we want to know. What changed, right? And so we're going to pick out one of these conditions uh, as the specifically the cause and the other ones we're, <clears throat> we're going to call background conditions, even though they're all causal actually, right? Okay. So we also have the difference between a partial and a complete cause, right? So if we were to actually want to know the full story about why the fire happened or why something happened, right? We would give, or we'd be asking for the complete cause, which would be the combination of all the conditions which together are sufficient for the effect. Whereas in that 
in light of that, right, if we're looking for a complete cause, one of the conditions alone would just be a partial cause. So a person could say, okay, yeah, you can call the spark the, the cause of the fire because that's what changed. But in the real story, that's just a partial cause. Because it's not just the spark that brought about the fire. It was the spark plus the fact that there's oxygen and fuel there, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if we were talking about a, another planet, right, where there's no oxygen, and then we saw that something burned down, we might ask, well, what caused that? In that case, the presence of oxygen would be considered kind of, in this case, the cause, because that would be something new and different. So this is all very contextual, right? We're looking for the specific thing that changed. But if we want something that's completely explanatory, we're asking for a full explanation of something. In that case, we're going to have to bring about all, you know, bring to bring to attention all the conditions, right? And if we only name one of them, it's going to be a partial cause only. And a complete cause would require naming all the conditions together, which are sufficient for the effect, right? That means which are enough to bring the effect about so that the effect could not be otherwise, right? Okay. So the example of this that I gave was kind of interesting from uh, Al-Ghazali's book, Incoherence of the Philosophers. And there he gives an analogy uh, uh, to, um, or an example, like let's say a hypothetical example, rather, to a blind man who is blind since birth. And he says that, you know, imagine that this man has cataracts and he's had that, he's been that way since birth, so he's never seen anything. And somebody heals him, right? Somebody removes the cataracts from his eyes in the daytime and suddenly he sees, right? And he would think that the cause of his seeing is his eyes being clear from the cataract plus an object that's colored in front of him. So he would think as long as my eyes are clear and there's a colored object in front of me, I will see color, right? So that his clear eye and the colored object is the complete cause in his mind, right? But then uh, when the sun sets and it gets dark, he would realize, oh, wait, it wasn't just those two things. There's something else that I require in order to see, not just my eye being clear and also the object being colored, but I need the light, right? Which he didn't even notice from the beginning, right? Because you don't notice light. You only notice the things that light lights up that allow you, light allows you to see. So in any case, what we got here is an, an example of uh, where somebody thinks they have understood the complete cause of something, but actually turns out to be only a partial cause. So in terms of our, you know, general critical thinking skills, we should always remember that it's possible that what we take to be a complete cause is really only a partial cause because there may be some background condition that is necessary for you know the effect that we're um, considering, uh, which we don't know of yet. Which we you know, and usually background conditions are the types of things which it's harder to notice precisely because they are more constant than the things that change like a spark. Right. Okay. We also have remote, remote or indirect versus proximate or direct causes. This is pretty simple. So if A causes B and B causes C, then B is proximate to C, but A is a remote cause of C because A causes C only through causing B. And likewise, if we had, you know, a number, a larger number of intermediaries, if A caused B and B caused C and C caused D, then A is a remote cause of D, right? Okay. And usually the more remote the thing is, the more proximate, the more partial it'll be as well. Yeah. Okay. So the last thing we need to discuss for this little section <clears throat> is the Inus condition. This is a little bit complex, but it can be, I think, a useful tool for um, being precise about the kinds of causal relation that we think about between one thing and another. Right, especially when we want to say that something was the cause of something else. Uh, when we're talking about historical events or, you know, anything really. Um, it's good to sort of be precise. And this is a lot of times, I think, what people mean when they claim that one thing was the cause of something else. 
it seems to be the case that this is what we mean when we say that the spark is in this, is, is a cause of the fire. It's a theory or a, a concept that was um, a, developed and introduced into philosophy by a guy named John Mackey. Um, and uh, it has also been criticized. Every concept in philosophy has been criticized and sort of, you know, um, uh, subject to a lot of scrutiny. Uh, so you're not going to find any kind of definition of cause, which is going to be without its, uh, let's say, detractors or actual, you know, um, limitations, let's say, problems that it raises. But this one is very useful, right? So an INIS condition is an insufficient but necessary member of a set of conditions that is unnecessary but sufficient for the effect. So we've already talked about what we mean by sufficient and necessary and insufficient just means not sufficient and unnecessary just means not necessary. So we're talking about something which is a not sufficient but necessary member of a set of conditions that is unnecessary but sufficient for the effect. So let's go back to our spark, right? The spark, let's say that there's a fire, uh, there's a house that burned down in a fire and we wanna know how the fire started. And if we say that a spark was a cause, we don't wanna say that the spark was a necessary condition for the fire, because if the spark was a necessary condition for the fire, it has to be the case that that fire could not have started without the spark. But that doesn't seem to be the case because I could have thrown a match, right? Or lightning could have struck, or a meteor could have fell, or whatever, right? I mean, there's so many different ways that the heat could have been provided for that fire, yeah? And so uh, we won't say that the spark was a necessary condition for the fire, yet it was the cause. We won't wanna say that the spark was a sufficient condition for the fire either because the spark could have happened without the fire, right? Because again, the oxygen had to be there and also the fuel has to be just, you know, I mean, sort of in the right situation, yeah? And so if the fire could have happened without the spark, and if the spark could have happened without the fire, that means that the spark was not a necessary condition for the fire, and also that the spark was not a sufficient condition for the fire. So Mackey's asking the question, then what are we gonna say about the spark? We say it's the cause, what does it mean, right? And this is his answer. So let's say that S means the spark, M means a lit match, and O just means the presence of oxygen. And then we'll say F means the presence of fuel, okay? In that case, we can have this set of conditions, SOF, right? The spark, the presence of oxygen, and the presence of fuel. And we'll say that these three together is a sufficient condition for the fire. With the spark plus the oxygen plus the fuel in the right situation is enough to make the fire happen. So given those conditions altogether, the fire had to occur, right? It's sufficient for the fire. If SOF, then fire. We could put it that way, yeah? Now, S is part of this, right? So S by itself is not sufficient because the whole set is what's sufficient, right? But it's this set which is sufficient. So S being a necessary part of that set if you removed S from that set, then there wouldn't have been a fire. That's what it means. To, that's what it means to say that S is insufficient, but necessary member of a set. Yeah. So without S, this set would not be sufficient. But with S, this set is sufficient. The set is not necessary, but it is a sufficient condition for the fire. Yeah. Why is that set not necessary? Well, because you could have had another set. That was the set of conditions that are that I throw a match, right, into the fuel in the presence of oxygen. That would also start the fire, in which case my setting the match or my throwing the match would be necessary as part of this set. If I take the match throwing out of this set, this set wouldn't be sufficient. So here's a set of conditions, a spark, oxygen, and fuel. And here's another set of conditions, a match, oxygen, and fuel, right? 
Both of these as whole sets are sufficient for the fire, but neither of them is necessary for the fire because without one set of conditions, a different set of conditions might have been able to bring about the fire, right? So each of these sets is sufficient, but not necessary. Mm -hmm. Good. So S being a member of such a set, then is an insufficient but necessary member of a set of conditions that is unnecessary but sufficient for the effect. That's to say it's an INS condition. <coughs> mm -hmm. So there we go. Uh, for Mackey, he's suggesting that, okay, then a cause is an INS condition. When Mackey wrote his paper, he's given, he's trying to give a theory of causation. We don't need to give a theory of causation here because this is just critical thinking class. But what we are giving here is a tool that is to say a way to make your thinking about cause and causation precise when you make a specific claim or when you're asking about a certain thing, right? So you want to know uh, whether something is the cause, uh, you know, like if, 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 if there's a spark um, and you want to know whether the spark or you want to say that the spark was the cause of the fire, right? And someone says, well, the fire could have happened without the spark, you know, it could have happened with a lit match instead. So it's not the cause. You can say, well, what I mean to say is that it's an INIS condition. It's a cause in this sense, right? Not in the sense that the fire couldn't have happened without it or that by itself the spark caused the fire because, of course, there had to be oxygen and fuel, right? But what I mean to say is that it's an INIS condition, and at least it helps your thinking be more precise. Yeah. Last thing we're going to talk about is some first principles of causal reasoning. We discussed in the book a fallacy. We started with discussing a fallacy, the fallacy of post hoc ergo proctor hoc. That is to say that we infer that one thing, that because one thing happened after another, right, then that which happened before it is the cause, yeah? In other words, that A happened before B proves that A is the cause of B. But the simple fact that A happened before B does not prove that A is the cause of B. Because a lot of things happen before other things, and that doesn't mean they're the cause, right? Like I wrapped the, my, you know, knuckle on the desk, and I said, oh, that's the cause of the, the noise that you heard. But probably right after I wrapped my knuckle on the desk, somewhere in China, a baby was born, right? The fact that I knocked on the desk right before the baby was born doesn't mean that my wrap, wrapping on the desk is the cause of the baby being born, yeah? So this idea that if something happened before something else, then it's the cause of that thing is a fallacy. Um, maybe we sometimes think that because the opposite is true, right? Uh, if something is the cause of something else, then that has to be uh, happened before it, right? Yeah, so if A is because of B, then B has to be before A and A has to be after B. The effect cannot come before the cause. It either has to be simultaneous with the cause or after the cause, right? So if I knocked on the desk and then after that you heard the sound, right? Then, you know, the effect came after it. It's not the effect because it came after, but it's the other way around, right? If the effect is the effect of that cause, right? If the sound is the effect of my rapping on the desk, then certainly my rapping on the desk had to have happened before the sound, right? Or at least at the same time as the sound. Yeah. And sometimes causes occur before and sometimes they occur at the same time as their effect, but causes never come after the effect, right? So this is a rule. And the last one is that like causes produce like effects. If some A is the cause of a B, then any other A, just like the first A, will also cause a B, just like that last B, right? If we didn't have this rule, we wouldn't be able to learn from experience at all, okay? Because we wouldn't, you know, actually assume or presume or trust or know, however it turns out to be, that the world and nature around us that we experience is uniform and regular, right? So if A was the cause of B in a previous situation 
and a new A in the current situation, which is just like the previous A in a situation that's just similar as the last one, does not cause a B, then it must have been something else besides A that caused B last time. There must be some difference, right? Uh, if we didn't think this way, we wouldn't be able to actually, you know, interact with the world around us uh, in any kind of rational way at all. Yeah. So who knows why we believe, why, whether we're justified in, in believing this or why that's a different philosophical question, but it does manifestly the case that if the world were not like this, we would not be able to operate in the world. And if we did not think that the world was like this, we would not be able to operate in the world. So that's why we're calling this a first principle of causal reason. So then there are just two there, right? The cause cannot come after the effect. That's no, that doesn't make any sense, right? The cause has to exist first before the effect can exist. And secondly, like causes produce like effects.